This morning, Columbia University's president looks to avoid the Harvard trap and testify before lawmakers on how their campus is combating anti-Semitism. It comes amid a surge of nationwide anti-Israel protests. So here to go off the grid are Fox and Friends weekend co-host Pete Hegseth and Will Kane. Good morning, guys. Good morning. morning. Good morning. So, uh, Pete, I'll start with you because you uh, went to an Ivy League university, and this lady is testifying. <laughs> she, uh, in December, she was supposed to testify, but said she had a scheduling conflict. But we saw what happened when the president of Harvard and Penn and MIT testified. Two of them had to resign after that. What do you expect today? Well, that was the best scheduling, scheduling conflict she's ever had. Now she gets to do over and watch what everybody else did wrong. Of course, it'll be highly choreographed for her. But, you know, Will, we don't like to talk about New York City on Off the Grid if we can avoid it, right? I'd rather talk about University of Texas or University of Tennessee or University of Minnesota. You pick your university out there. Well, the protests and anti-Israel, anti-American sentiment you see on your campus in middle America, almost all of it came from Columbia University. Almost all of it came from the teacher's college there, from the Marxist Frankfurt School that landed there because Columbia has the number one teacher's college in America. So Columbia has been teaching teachers uh, how to be anti-American and now, by extension, anti-Israel for decades. So it shouldn't surprise us that Columbia has a really big anti-American problem on their hands with terrorist flags being flown on their campus and, you know, from the river to the sea. Uh, it's who they are. It's... Critical theory is the Marx is that uh, is that Frankfurt School theory. That's where critical race theory. It's oppressor oppressed, and in this matrix, will we know where everybody falls? Will she said in a Wall Street Journal op-ed. Yeah. Let me just read this, and I'll get your response. Calling for the genocide of a people, whether they are Israelis, Palestinians, Jews, Muslims, or anyone else, has no place at a university in a university community. Such words are outside the bounds of legitimate debate and unimaginably harmful. Your response? Yeah. Well, first, I'm sorry I laughed about Pete's Ivy League education. There's only a few circles li left in life where that can be seen as an insult instead of a compliment. And Fox and Friends Weekend is one of those few places where it can serve as an insult. Yeah. But uh, uh, Pete's education is well served because he takes us through the history there, which he's written about in his book, Battle for the American Mind. He's talked about how this all happened over a century, not over a few months. But I do want to say... We, we, Pete gives us a perspective that, sh that allows us to have well-earned cynicism. With that well-earned cynicism, let me now say, here's some good things that this, this president of Columbia is saying. Now, first of all, she's not an idiot. She watched those others place their own heads in the guillotine, and she thought, yes. mm, maybe I won't put my head under the blade. But she has written in the Wall Street Journal, to your point, Ainsley, and what I was appreciative about what she said is two things. She said, maybe we can designate a specific place on campus for protest. And at first you're like, well, free speech should be everywhere. But, you know, protest and free speech can be separated. And if you're going to have these protests that offend some people, maybe you can have like a speaker's corner, which they have in London, which is almost like anything goes short of calls for genocide. But here's what's more important, she said. And this is to the broader perspective that Pete talked about. A little bit short of what Pete talked about. She said, over the past half century, we've done a good job of integrating more people from different backgrounds into our college, but we've ignored the ability to build a community. And we need to look at the things that tie human beings together. She's on to something. Hey, President Columbia, what ties us together, at least in this nation? Americans. Mm -hmm. We're all still Americans. And you might lean into that thing that black, white, man, woman still brings us together on your campus at Columbia. All right, Pete, Will, thank you so much for weighing in on this. I talked so thank much you. that we didn't get to talk about barbecue. I know. I know, I know. I was so <laughs> we looking forward to it. We're going to talk barbecue. Well, the announcement is Memphis barbecue. Is about, Memphis barbecue is about to become one of Tennessee's official state foods. Hot slaw is also on the list. And in your state, Will, chili was adopted mm -hmm. as the Texas state dish May 11th, yeah. 1977. Chili. Oh, nice, Will. <laughs> you get you chili. Get chili. That's well, awesome. Congratulations, cool. Pete. Cool. Congratulations. Memphis barbecue, <laughs> state food. It's the Thank second you. best type of barbecue in the country after Texas barbecue. No, after oh. South Carolina barbecue, mustard base, Kansas City. Ainsley, no. I'm kind of with you. I love Carolina right? barbecue. Vinegar-based Carolina barbecue is great. I mean, Memphis is awesome, but hey. I'm kind of a Carolina vinegar base. Thank you. The rankings yeah. go. Quickly, the rankings go Texas, Memphis, Kansas City, Carolina. Sorry, no. Ainsley, I'm not no. into mustard and vinegar. No. Or oh. pulled pork. This is not even up Carolina, for debate. Carolina, Memphis, Texas. Thank you.
Thank you. Always Texas, And put some Texas, banana pudding it. on the side, too. <laughs> it's the best. All right, thanks, guys. And some hot slaw.